Lord, we adore you. We bow before no one but you. We worship you. We give you glory. We read the account of the throne room in heaven where there are these creatures that are flying around your throne singing holy, holy, holy. And there are 24 elders that are circled around the throne. And every time the creatures sings holy, 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 the elders fall down and worship. They cast their crowns at your feet. And Lord, we are no different than them. We fall down at your feet and we worship you. And any crowns that we have, anything that we think that we've accomplished, any great thing that we think that we've done, we throw it at your feet. In worship, Lord, and we praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So for those of you who haven't been here in the last 18 months and don't know that 18 months ago I became a grandfather, Allie and Andrew didn't become parents. I became a grandfather. That's just make sure we've got that straight. Um, one of the things that Briley likes to do is watch videos. And I was noticing a trend in the videos that she was watching. And it was a really easy trend to pick up because she only watched four. Over and over and over and over and over. <clears throat> And we decided that she needed some more variety in her life. She needed some different songs. So last Saturday, Andrew and I were sitting on the couch watching videos with Briley. And after we watched Let It Go for the 782nd time that day, I said, we got to find something different. And I started clicking, and I found these Sunday school videos. And they're, they're kind of catchy. They're kind of cool. But there was one that you remember the old song, Hallelujah, 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 Praise Ye the Lord. Well, they stop, and they say, Praise, what's that? It's a, help me out, Allie. Yippee, Yahoo, way to go, God. Sometimes we need to stop and say, hey, you know, yippee, yahoo, way to go, God. Because there's things that are happening that we don't recognize, that we don't stop and say, hey, God, you really outdid yourself that time. You know, uh, Valentine's Day has come and gone, but, you know, the, the cheesy thing for pastors to say is they look at their wives and say, Yay, Yahoo, yippee, yay, yay, way to go, God. You outdid yourself. Well, God outdid himself with my wife. He really did. But there's so much. There's so much in our world. And if we don't stop and say, wow, way to go, God, we find ourselves getting stuck in this rut where we're saying, that's another day. That's another Whatever, oh hum. As we go through our dreary life, God has done some amazing things. And we need to remember that. We need, and it's not just when we're singing songs or when I get up here and jump around and act like a fool or whatever. It's all the time. Every minute of every day. 
You took a breath. Way to go, God. I got to breathe one more breath. We owe him praise for everything. And we need to remember that. And I th- this is what I noticed from watching those videos with Briley is that they lifted my spirit. Just the the idea and the the songs. I mean, they're they're the songs that we sang in Sunday school. This little light of mine, and and the graphics are amazing because it's a light bulb walking down the street singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Uh, great fun songs that lift our spirits. Remember when when. When we leave here in a half hour or so, or however, you know, whenever we leave here today and we go out of this building, we're going to be in a world that's dark. We're going to be in a world that's dreary. We're going to be in a world that's lost. And guess what? We have the roadmap. We have the flashlight. We have the compass. We have everything that they need. Okay, let's uh, let's get into the the uh, passage that I wanted to speak from this morning, which is Luke sixteen nineteen through thirty one. And as you can see from the graphic on the screen, it's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Well, you guys get to see. I don't get to see. We'll do that. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his feet was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, which is another one of those really great Sunday school songs. I I was just so you know, I'm thinking about doing a series of the the old stories from the Old Testament, and I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, for worship, bring back some of those old Sunday school songs. Father Abraham, anybody? And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you're in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's. There we go. My father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes from them, goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And we've all heard, we've all heard this story before, and we've all heard the interpretation of this story before, and we've We've all heard about how the rich man was a bad, bad man and how Lazarus was a good, good man. And we, we've been through all of that. And I want to look at it just a little bit today. I, when, when we look at this story 
And there's controversy about this story because it's the, if it is considered to be a parable, it's the only parable where Jesus ever named somebody, gave the people in it a name. Think of all the other parables. They're, they're a father and his two sons, but they don't have any names. There's the, the man that was walking on the road and he was beat up by the, by the robbers and he doesn't have a name and the robbers don't have a name and none of the people that walked by him had a name. And even the guy that stopped to help doesn't get named. He's just called a Samaritan. Jesus didn't give people in his parables names. So there are some people that believe that this is an actual factual account that Jesus is relating. I don't know that I would go that far because there's too many inconsistencies that come up if that's the, if that's the case. But it is out there that, pe that people talk about that, that this is, this is an account, a real account of something that happened. I'm going to go with it's a parable. And I want to look at it a little bit like it's a parable because when you look at a parable, there are certain things that you have to do. Parables are constructed in such a way that you put yourself into the story. Who am I in this story? Am I Lazarus? Am I the rich man? Clearly, I'm not Father Abraham. Am I one of the rich man's brothers? Who am I in this story? But we have Lazarus. And the interesting thing about Lazarus, the name, is that it means God helps. So we've got Lazarus laying there at the gate of a rich man. And Jesus goes out of his way to describe this rich man. He has purple linen. Only royalty, only really, really rich people had purple linen because it, the way that they made the purple linen back then, they, there was a specific fish that they caught. And that specific f fish had ink that went in its throat. So they had to catch this fish and they had to drain the ink from that fish and they would use that to dye the linen. It's expensive. It's really, really expensive. People didn't have purple linen. People didn't, that's not something that, when they got up and they put their robes on in the morning, they weren't purple because it's so expensive. So the fact that this guy had purple linen says he was really, really rich. And Lazarus is laying there at his gate. And the way that the story is told, we get the picture that every time the man had to go, <coughs> excuse me, every time the man had to go out, he had to step over Lazarus, look at him, and walk away from him, and ignore him. And Lazarus wasn't even asking for a lot. He wasn't asking for, hey, you know, give me enough money so I can get a house. And I can set up a business. He was asking for some crumbs from the guy's table. He was asking for a little bit of food on any given day. Just give me a little bit. And the guy stepped over him and kept on going to do whatever his business was for the day. So we look at this parable... And often we think that God is talking to us about how we're supposed to treat the have-nots, the people who don't have, the people who are poor. How are we supposed to treat the poor? And we look at this in a completely physical frame of reference. We have everything that we have 
and they have nothing. What are we supposed to do? Clearly, we're not supposed to walk over them and keep on going. We're supposed to stop and help them. Because if we don't, well, we see what happens to the rich man. I want to look at it in a different context this morning. I don't want to look at it in a strictly physical context. I want to look at it in a spiritual context. I want to look at it in a context of this. I have this. Every one of you has one of these, right? Every one of you has one. How many of you have more than one? How many of you think you have more than I do? Everybody go like this. Nobody has more than I do. Bob, you asked a question. How many of you have asked Jesus into your heart? I know you all, you can all raise your hands. Go ahead, it's fine. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. There's a whole world that doesn't. And they're laying right outside our gate. They're laying where we can't help but see them. And I read, those of you who follow me on Facebook know that in my devotions I've been reading through Luke. And I when I read through that parable again and that struck me, I was thinking about it and I was thinking about it in those terms and I finished Luke and I started reading in John and there's a story in John and it's a story that actually happened, the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. You know the story. Jesus and his disciples are passing through Samaria on their way to wherever they were going. And they stopped. For some reason, Jesus stopped at this well, and the disciples went on into town. Maybe they were going to get supplies. Maybe they were going to get food. Whatever they were doing, they they went into town. And Jesus is sitting at the well. And this woman comes up, and Jesus says to the woman, Give me something to drink out of the well. Draw me some water. And the woman says, how is it that you ask me to get you something to drink? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and we have nothing to do with each other. And I don't, you don't have a bucket. How am I going to get you any water? And Jesus says, if you knew who it was who you were talking to, you would have asked and I would have given you water that you would never thirst again. And she said, tell me about this water. And they had a conversation. And then Jesus said to her, well, go get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, you've rightly said that. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. And she went into town And she started telling people, I've met this prophet. He told me everything that's ever happened in my life. He told me everything. Come on back. You need to hear from him. While she was there, the disciples came back. And the disciples were urging Jesus to leave. Saying, you have to go. We have to go. We have to go eat. It's time to eat. It's food time. Let's go. Let's go eat. And Jesus just hung there. And what struck me was in John 4, verses 39 to 42. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. 
And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we've heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Back up. The disciples are saying, Jesus, we got to go. We got to leave this place. We have to go get food. Old Country Buffet is going to close. We got to get there. Come on, let's go. And Jesus responded to them the same way that he responded to Satan. My food is to do my father's work. If Jesus had gone with the disciples to eat, then those many who believed would never have met him. They would have never met him. If Jesus would have listened to his stomach, and it's perfectly appropriate at that moment that my stomach started to growl, if Jesus would have listened to his stomach, if he would have listened to his hunger, if he would have listened to his flesh, and went with the disciples to go get food, then those many who believed never would have heard. They wouldn't have heard. Matthew 9. As Jesus talking, he's talking to his disciples, and and he's looking at a field, He says, look, raise up your eyes. Look, for the field is ripe under the harvest. And in Matthew 9, 38, he says, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers. Now, you guys have heard me talk about this passage before. The funny thing about that is, in the very next breath, Jesus starts sending out the disciples. In the very next breath, he starts sending them out into the field. And I got to tell you, now is the time to get involved because we are like the rich man. We have what the world needs We are filthy rich in spiritual blessings. And we're content to say, well, you shouldn't live like that, and you shouldn't do that, and you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do that, and oh, you can't do that, and unless you believe like this, you can't be one of us. We're stepping over the beggars on the streets, throwing them our crumbs, And we've got the truth. We have the truth. And the truth is so simple. Jesus came to save sinners, of which I am the chief. You know what that means? If Jesus saved me, he can save you. Yeah. You, laying on the floor, laying on the ground, outside my house where I have all these riches. Jesus saved me. He can save you. And you know what it takes for them to hear? It's hard. This is hard. Listen real close. This is what it takes for them to hear. We. We have to tell them. We don't have to build any elaborate structures. We just have to tell them. We don't have to tell them what they should and, should and shouldn't be doing. We just have to tell them. Jesus died to save sinners. Jesus died to save sinners. 
Quick survey, is there anybody in this room who isn't a sinner? All right, good. I didn't have to call anybody out for lying, so that's good. We're all sinners. Jesus died to save us. We're all in the same boat. A couple weeks ago, I talked about how an Acts 2 church needs to be diverse. The reason why we can be diverse is because every one of us is in the same boat. None of us is better than any of the others. We just have to tell them. We got to the prize first. Now we have to share it. But we don't have any opportunity. Sure you do. You always do. Whether you go with Bob out on a street corner and hand out Bibles, or whether you go on Facebook and you say, Jesus loves you to somebody. Or whether you go to school and when someone's having a bad day, you say, hey, you know what? Jesus loves you. Let me pray with you. When you go to work, you know work is a mission field? It's also a workplace. Don't get, I am not telling anybody to not do their work and start, start preaching. That's not what I'm saying. Do your work because that's a testimony. Work hard. Be the best worker that they have wherever you work because that's a testimony. But when those conversations happen in the break room, at the water cooler, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know what? Jesus is the answer. We need to start telling people. I have some practical ways that we can get involved too. Some practical ways that are coming up because as Providence would have it, Minneapolis is about to be thrust into the national spotlight once again. And not for a good reason. Derek Chauvin's trial is going to begin in March. And we know there's going to be controversy and there's going to be picketing and there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on. But before it even has a chance to happen, the, the jury selection begins on March 8th. Before it even has a chance to happen on March 7th, a group of 250 pastors are gathering at the government center and we're going to pray. I'm going to be there. I need somebody to be here from 3 to 4. That Sunday, it's a Sunday afternoon, so you would have to come to church in the morning and then come back. But I have faith in you, you can do it. I need someone who will lead the prayer here And I need people to come back here and pray. I would take you all with me down to the government center if I could. But we're limited to only having 250 people there. So we're limiting it only to pastors. That's March 7th. March 8th. The day that the jury selection begins from noon to 1. This this space is going to be open. I'm going to be in here praying. Come and pray with me. Do you know that the most effective weapon that we have against whatever the enemy may be thinking is prayer? Do you know it's the most important weapon that we have? Come and pray with me. We're going to pray for peace to prevail in Minneapolis. We're going to pray that Christians will shine their light. We're going to pray that the church will be unified. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, by your love one for another. How we come together in times of crisis shows the world what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. Come and pray. March 18th at 7 o'clock, and I believe that is going to be here, but I'm not 100% sure. It's a Thursday night, and we're still talking about the logistics of where it's going to be. But we had a prayer meeting like this a few weeks ago, and we had 30 people in here praying. And I am going to tell you, I have a friend 
in Ohio who swears. He was having a prayer meeting one night, and the Holy Spirit was so powerful that the fire department came and asked where the fire was because there were flames shooting up through the through the roof of the church. And I can I'm telling you, that night there were flames shooting up through the roof of this church. And I think we're gonna do it again. On March 18th, churches from all over Anoka County, we're all getting together and we're praying. Pastor, all you're talking about is praying. Well, yeah. It's the most important thing that we can do. It's the most powerful thing that we can do. We get all confused. We get all messed up. We think that we have to come up with our own plans and we have to devise all of these schemes and all. We just have to pray. God will show us what to do. He'll tell us what to do. You'll be amazed at the plans that will come out of those times when we get together and pray. You'll be amazed at what will happen as people walk out of here and they start sharing the gospel with their friends. You'll be amazed. I promise you. Come and pray. Be here. Be here. It's not only the least that we can do. It's the best that we can do because there's a world laying outside our doorsteps and they're begging for crumbs and they don't need our political ideologies and they don't need our theological treaties but they do need our Jesus they do need him The two men that started Gideon's started out of a prayer meeting. They got together and prayed. And they said, hey, how about if we hand out some Bibles? Because they got this idea while they were praying. And now there's 270,000 Gideon's throughout the world. Yeah. Some of them are friends of mine. You know Carl Thompson. Amazing man of God. Carl was one of the people that spoke greatly into my life before he died. He was a Gideon. If we will be faithful and do our part, pray and listen to God, He will be faithful and do his part. He'll tell us what to do. He'll tell us where to go, how to do it. But you know what? We don't have to wait until March 7th to pray. We don't have to wait until March 8th. We can pray right now. That's the amazing thing about prayer. You don't need anything to be able to do it. You don't even have to be able to speak out loud. You can pray in your head. You know, mutes who can't speak pray? They do. You don't have to be able to make an audible noise to pray. Just wherever you are, you pray. But I don't know how. Talk to God. Just talk to him. Lord, we are in this place. And there are things that you want to do. And there are ways that you want to move. And there are people that you're speaking to right now that are hearing your voice, maybe for the first time they've ever heard your voice telling them, I want you to do this.
Lord, let us hear. We don't want to be like the rich man. We don't want to hold our riches to ourself. We don't want to step over a world that so desperately needs us. Needs what we have. Needs us to share you with them. We want to be what you call us to be. People who follow you and who make disciples of all people. Everywhere. Wherever we go. Lord, may we be consumed with a passion of letting the world know that you love them. Letting the world know that you died to save them. And may we not get caught up in our own stuff and attach our own stuff to that very simple message. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you love us so much that you did die for us. Not only that, but you love us so much that you said, you come to me and I'm going to make you into something great. You will be my workmanship created for good works. Lord, that's who we want to be. We want to be your workmanship created for good works, doing what you have led us to do, going where you have led us to go, being who you have called us to be in every place. Lord, that it would be like it was on the day of Pentecost and the days following, where the people were seeing what happened to your people and they were so amazed. But the thing that amazes me as I read those accounts is that it says they were held in high esteem by everybody. We've made a mess out of your church. We're not held in high esteem. We've made a mess, Lord. Make us right. Bring us back to where we're supposed to be. That our focus would be on you and you alone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us and that you don't abandon us when we make a mess. You help us. You show us how to work through it. You bring us through. And you're bringing us through this. Thank you, Lord. We do love you. We praise you. We give